by God who lives and reigns in the hearts and the flesh of every man, woman, boy, and child. Um, as my brother demonstrated, may I please have permission from an elder to continue speaking. Thank you, Mama. And then also, I've come a long way, and I want to honor my flesh and blood, my sister who is here with me. I would not be here if, I, if it was not for her. Brothers and sisters, um, as you can see, this is the focus of my presentation. And there is some concerns that I would like to raise, but hopefully you will see or sense the solutions towards the end. So my conceptual framework, or the key concepts that I want to elaborate through this dialogue with you, are first of all, my perceptions of a crisis. And when I speak of a crisis, I'm speaking of dislocation in almost every domain of the African experience. Whether it's economic, spiritual, cultural, I believe that there is a, 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 a crisis in the Pan-African community. Secondly, my following concept that I want to apply is epistemology. And by that I mean the way that the Pan-African community generates, contests, and modifies knowledge. And then thirdly, I want to incorporate the concept of ontology. And by ontology, I mean our reality, what it means to us as Africans to exist. Now, what are our crises? Let's just take a brief look at this. Please bear in mind, sisters and brothers and mothers and fathers, that I am speaking from the position of Southern Africa. And at the bottom right, you'll see the reality that is still in South Africa right now. In fact, more than 50% of the South African youth are unemployed. That's the official unemployment rate. And then I want to say with the adults, the official unemployment rate is around 36%. That is a crisis. Top left, I don't have to speak to you about that. This, this Black Lives Matter initiative emerged here amongst our sisters and brothers in this continent. The top right is interesting because I happened to watch a video where I saw students here in Philadelphia, um, I don't know what the, the appropriate word is, but rush a wawa. And for me, that is also evidence of dislocation, cultural, economic dislocation amongst the youth. I'll come back to that. And then finally, as a whole, the continent is being dislodged also, dislocated by virtue of African people, the masses of African people. I would add even intellectuals not controlling our rich natural resources, and at the moment, China is actually leading in, if I can call it, a new colonial movement. So these are some of our African crisis, pan-African crisis, though this is not all. Now, why do we have this crisis? And I, I humbly put to you that, for me, we continue to experience the dislocation that Professor Asante and many others speak of. And my view is that our dislocation is it's cultural, it's spiritual, it's related to our identity, and it's also intellectual. Now you may ask, why is it intellectual? I believe that as a community of scholars, we still have to synchronize, we still have to find a way as I heard my brother say yesterday, to take this knowledge and functionally apply it amongst our people who truly need access to new ways of being, um, new ways of thinking. Secondly, for me, this crisis emerges from epistemic fractures. And by epistemic fractures, I'm referring to the ways that we think the ways that we argue, our seemingly inability to negotiate principles on the one hand for formulating solutions or positive argument, but also identifying fallacies that hold us back in our arguments with each other. So to give you examples of fallacies, sitting here right now, we are diverse spiritually, culturally, 
And my sense is that though we are expected to critically engage with each other, sometimes we tend to be undermining in the way that we regard each other's spirituality or deep cultural beliefs. And for me, that results in epistemic fractures, and then subsequently we have these crises that we're having a hard time getting over. So my, to refer to Professor Azama, all of this leads me to the claim that we as a community, we as African people, we as pan-African community need to formulate an ontology, some kind of a framework where we agree upon strategies, principles, and fallacies to move forward collectively in all domains. Now, what is the significance of ontology? And where does Diop's um, philosophy fit into this? First of all, Diop emphasizes cultural endurance. So what I'm suggesting is that there are deep cultural principles amongst us, despite uh, spiritual or um, cultural variations that we share. My brother just spoke about that now, and he did it precisely by revealing how African languages highlight our oneness. I think this is self-explanatory. We need to continue to elaborate our knowledge of self, and such events are crucial in that process. I also believe that the knowledge that we acquire from our brothers and from each and every one of us here needs to be applied, needs to be directly injected into our realities. And what I mean by that is, how does the knowledge of ancient Africa commit our languages? How does that integrate with the way that we claim our independence continentally, economically? And what I want to suggest to you is that if I think about the youth who rushed Wawa, one of the reasons they did that is because they don't sense that cultural integration, they don't sense the spiritual, economic integration with the system. And so it's our duties to, to make this ontology real. So we need to actualize, we need to manifest what Diop and, and Professor Assange and even Professor Mazama and many others have shared with us continually. Now, I want to speak about praxis, and by praxis I mean taking the theory and putting it into practice. Now, Diop spoke about the cultural unity of black Africa. For me, that's our ontology, but our brother spoke about that now. He revealed how from the south to the, sorry, from the north to the, the west to the south, African people are one. We find that in our languages. Um, so, as we integrate our epistemologies, our ways of thinking, as we bring our ontologies, as we make it real. For me, brothers and sisters, those are key steps towards really living this renaissance, okay? Making it real. And our brother also just spoke about the institutions now. How is it then that we take all of the knowledge that we have, and as he argued, as he suggested, how do we create these new institutions? And brother, I would have loved to have heard that list. I saw the peer-reviewed article, so definitely, that is what I am also referring to, sisters and brothers and mothers and fathers. Now, Diop spoke about zones of confluence, and this is very important to me, because even though we are diverse in our cultures, how do we negotiate, and I mentioned this earlier, and I'm, I'm going to be, I'm gonna take this step, how do we as, so-called Christians, members of the Kemet tradition, um, Rastafari, Hebrews, uh, the six percenters, whatever it may be, how do we extract the best of what it is that we represent and what we know to create this new ontology where we can proceed as a people? Are our attitudes towards each other, are we being condescending? Do we look down on each other because of our intellectual or spiritual traditions? I think we need to move beyond that, if that is the case. So what I'm suggesting is that, in the same sense that we need to come up with strategies and principles and also 
identify unnegotiated moods amongst ourselves. We need to list our behaviors and our thoughts that constrain our project of African Renaissance and unity. So what I want to share with you, and this also links with my brother, is that all African people are genetically one. Brother spoke to you from a linguistic perspective. What I'm sharing with you now is that between Ethiopia and the Batwa, who are the, the Pygmies, and the Khoisan in Southern Africa, all of our genes are there. So for me, genetically, we are one. Linguistically, the brother showed how we are one. And for me, that is a great platform for us to proceed and articulate and agree upon an ontology to move forward and make this African renaissance even more real than it is now. Just on the issue of why did Africans migrate, because the brother, you spoke about this in your linguistic reasoning, why did Africans migrate all the way to the freezing southern Africa and also go and hide in the forest as the, the Batwa did? My claim is that it's because of being rejected. It's because of African people. It's because of us creating barriers amongst ourselves. And so I want to use this as a metaphor so that we can understand, on the one hand, our unity, but also, on the other hand, how we, as sisters and brothers and mothers and fathers, can alienate each other. I'm not going to go into this now, but I would be glad if you can just extract because of time. But I also want us to remember that our original modes of social organization were as hunters and gatherers and as pastoralists. So my claim is that as much as we can learn from ancient Kemet and even ancient Egypt, we, sorry, um, ancient Ethiopia, we can also learn from our original modes of social organization. And the point is that in that ontology, everybody had a role. We were all dependent upon each other. There was egalitarianism, there was equality, there were not hierarchies amongst ourselves. And the youth was central. So the elders, the sisters, the brothers, the mothers, and the fathers, we all united and we combined our disciplines to teach the youth. I would hope that we can incorporate this into our new African Renaissance ontology. And I just want to point out the hierarchies. So, brothers and sisters, in conclusion, I want to thank you for giving me this opportunity. I have been thinking about this for the longest time, and I struggle to put all of my thoughts into 10, 15 minutes. But what I hope that we all can take away is that can we diagrammatically even come up with some kind of a plan where we agree, okay, these are the principles and the values that we are going to follow. These are the fallacies or the unnegotiated moves that we are going to cast aside. And then, hopefully, we can come up with a plan. Thank you, family. Thank you so much.